the same year as the discovery of America. During renovations in this church with the aim of fixing a mosaic, workers discovered a mysterious inscription on a tombstone, Titulus Crucis. When they removed it, there was a lead box inside. Upon opening the box, they discovered a wooden fragment inscribed with the words that appeared on the cross of Jesus. How did this wooden tablet make it all the way to Rome? Why was it hidden in the wall? And for how long? Today, along with the inscription on the cross, in this Roman church it is possible to venerate a portion of the wood of the crucifixion and a nail from the Roman era. What connection do they share with Palestine? Is it possible these relics are directly connected to Jesus? We are in Rome, the Eternal City. It is the heart of the Catholic Church, a point of reference for Christianity. But the city assumed greater importance, especially after the 14th century. And there is a very important reason why. Jerusalem fell into Muslim hands, and in 1291, the last Christian stronghold in the Holy Land was lost, St. John of Acre. From then on, it was impossible to go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. It is a very dangerous place. Rome became the new Jerusalem. The relics and objects brought back from the Holy Land are then appreciated in a special way. And they are concentrated around the seat of papal authority. In the space of only a few square miles, we find pieces of the cross, its inscription, and a nail that pierced Christ. The tomb of the Apostle Peter, the first successor of Christ. It lies in a basilica that preserves the tip of the lance that pierced Christ on the cross and the veil with which Veronica wiped Christ's face along the road to Calvary. St. Paul, the great apostle to the nations, was also martyred here. The woman responsible for the latest excavations in the basilica reveals to us the findings of her research. The staircase from the palace of Pontius Pilate in Jerusalem, where Christ was condemned to death, is kept in this building. As a sign of devotion, pilgrims climb the 28 steps on their knees. column linked to the scourging of Christ is also found in the Eternal City. It is venerated in this chapel, located inside of one of the oldest churches in Rome, St. Proxides. Nearby, we find the Basilica of St. Mary Major. Below its main altar, several ancient boards are conserved that made their way here from the Holy Land. Tradition reveres them as belonging to the Manger of Christ. These are the relics related to the life of Christ that have converted Rome into the Eternal City. They have served to solidify the authority of those who from here exercise spiritual and for many years civil power. Thanks to them, this city became a focal point for pilgrims from all corners of the globe. Scholars the world over have tried to verify the authenticity of these objects. The Footprints of Jesus in Rome the history of Rome's relics have a protagonist who is as extraordinary as she is unknown, St. Helena. She was the wife of one emperor and the mother of another, Constantine. A key battle in her life and that of her son was fought here, where today we find these streets, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, joined to the bridge that still allows one to cross the Tiber to enter or exit Rome from the north. at the beginning of the 4th century, with the Roman Empire divided. Two aspiring rulers put everything at stake to gain everything on these banks of the Tiber. From Rome, Magnentius defends his position with a much larger army. Constantine arrives from the frontiers of the empire with fewer soldiers, but who are much more experienced. Tradition recounts that on the night before the battle, worried because of his numerical inferiority, Constantine received a sign in the sky. It was that the sign of the cross would help him in the battle. He had it painted on the shields of his soldiers, and the victory was overwhelming. The sign, according to Eusebius of Caesarea, will be the sign of the cross with the inscription, or with the words, In this sign you shall conquer. In fact, Constantine had the sign painted on his soldier's shield, 
a simplified sign of Christ. The two letters Chi and Ro, but simply Chi. The Battle of the Milion Bridge, which took place in the year 312, not only marks the rise of Constantine as the new emperor, it is also considered the first step toward Christianity becoming the religion of the empire. Constantine is the first Christian emperor. He was the first to die baptized. It's true he was baptized during the final moments of his life, but he's considered a Christian emperor, or at least had a favorable attitude toward Christianity. One of the greatest legacies Constantine left in Rome is St. Peter's Basilica, which was dedicated to the first pontiff in history. Constantine's decision to build a basilica was above all part of what all emperors did, building temples to the gods. But in this case, Constantine dedicates this basilica to St. Peter, perhaps even entrusting it to his protection. The church we can marvel at today in the Vatican was built just on top of the original basilica 12 centuries later. A new church, but with the same foundation as that of the 4th century, the tomb of St. Peter. Emperor Constantine himself built this great basilica around the year 320. It was the largest basilica in the Western Roman Empire, and he and his architects had to overcome extraordinary technical difficulties. He had to level the slope of the hill to make way for this great edifice, moving more than 12,589 cubic feet of earth. He had to cover over a cemetery which was still in use. All this he did on this very spot, even though it was a place that did not have a good reputation in antiquity, because he was absolutely sure that the tomb of Peter was here, because the bones and relics relics of Peter were here. Starting from the historical data, there's a large amount of archaeological investigation that confirms the tradition that the first pope in history was buried here. In the year 1949, during the pontificate of Pius XII, a series of excavations got underway that led to an extraordinary discovery. One of the tombs was clearly larger than the others, and it had been covered by a stone of greater quality. All the others nearby, this is truly striking, were buried facing toward it, as if attracted by a magnet. However, there was one decisive discovery, an inscription that read, Peter is here, dating back to the time of Emperor Constantine, making clear the origin of a traditional belief that has been respected for 2,000 years. Today, the church assures us that these bones belong to St. Peter. But even more importantly, a whole series of archaeological investigations indicate, with complete certainty, that St. Peter was buried in this place. There is a whole series of details surrounding the tomb of St. Peter that confirm, with absolute certainty, that the relics of St. Peter have never been removed from this exact area. They have always remained buried in the Vatican. Thanks to special permission granted by the director of the Vatican Necropolis, we are able to enter this unique place. Here we clearly sense and can nearly touch 2,000 years of devotion and history. Because we have the cupola, the great cupola of Michelangelo. Under this dome lies the Baldacan. Under the Baldacan sits the main altar of the Pope, which was installed there in 1594. Under this main altar, two more are positioned. One of them can be seen behind me, which dates back to the year 1123 during the time of Pope Calixtus II. Below that altar is positioned the medieval altar, originating in the 7th century. Even further down, we have the tomb of Constantine, which you can see behind me, and which contains within this marble case, what else? The sepulcher from the 2nd century. The sepulcher that was built right over the tomb of St. Peter, around 100 years after his death, and under which lies the pit dug into the ground in which St. Peter was buried. That's 2,000 years of devotion and history, one below the other and one inside the other. St. Peter was buried next to where he was murdered, the Circus of Nero. This is the place where the early Christians were murdered for their faith. Around the year 64, according to the pagan historians of the time. The historian Tacitus assures us that in this area of the Vatican, the first Christians were turned into human torches to illuminate the hill as the sun went down in the evening. They were crucified and their bodies devoured by dogs. Therefore, this is a holy place because it has been soaked with the blood of the martyrs. This very land of the Vatican Hill, this very ground beneath our feet, is sacred and blessed. 
Excavations in the 20th century were a sort of challenge to a centuries-old tradition. It is worth remembering that, in the 6th century, St. Gregory the Great refused to move the head of St. Paul or the remains of St. Peter to Constantinople, the seat of imperial power. In a letter to Constantina, the Empress of Byzantium, St. Gregory writes that it would be absolutely intolerable for anyone to touch the bodies of the saints. He guarantees that whoever dares to move the tombs of the saints buried in Rome would receive tremendous punishments. Because of this tradition, ever since the time of St. Gregory, the original burial sites of the saints have been respected. It was only during the historic excavations of the mid-20th century that an analysis was carried out on the bones found in the Vatican tomb. From all these investigations, it was deciphered that those relics all come from the body of a single individual, which in itself is also very important. They belong to one man, around 60 or 70 years old, who was of robust build. Therefore, it seems to be that, because of indications that are quite probable, especially if we add the inscription, Petros Eni, that Peter is here, we can affirm that this very spot is where the tomb of the apostle is located. Contrary to what many people believe, the popes did not reside in the Vatican until the 14th century. During the first centuries of Christianity, the chair or cathedra of the Bishop of Rome was, as is still today, in the Basilica of St. John Lateran. This is the Cathedral of Rome, and the popes lived in this area until the years in Avignon, France. When they returned, St. John Lateran was in ruins since it had been uninhabited for years. Following that period of exile, a monastery located on the Vatican Hill seemed like the best place for the Pope and the Curia to settle. Moreover, the fact of living next to Peter's tomb reinforced papal leadership over the universal church, which had been lost to some degree in France. The relics of the disciple chosen by Christ to lead the church helped determine the course of history. The majestic dome of Michelangelo covers Peter's tomb, but there is something else, an essential element for understanding the meaning of the whole basilica. This dome is supported by four magnificent pillars, within which are located the statues of St. Longinus the Centurion, St. Helena, St. Veronica, and St. Andrew. These four statues evoke the four main relics, called the Reliquius Magnus in Latin, that are preserved in the Vatican Basilica. These are relics that are directly related to the passion and life of Christ. How did the lance that pierced Jesus' side in Palestine get all the way to Rome? To understand, we have to go back a few centuries and travel to the east. We are in the year 1098 in Antioch. The soldiers of the First Crusade, who all came from several European countries, have managed to take the city after eight months of siege. It was a hard-fought battle, and many starved to death in the encampment surrounding the city. Despite the victory, the situation for Christians within the wall was desperate. After the siege, there was no food left in Antioch and an army of Muslims, organized in Damascus, was on its way. It was under these circumstances that a religious brother named Peter Bartholomew claimed to have had a vision. The lance that had pierced Christ was buried inside the cathedral. Excavations uncovered an iron tip, which they interpreted as the lance that would lead them to victory. So, with significantly fewer soldiers and suffering from hunger, the Crusaders left the city in desperation and attacked an enemy far superior in number. The Crusaders' victory was overwhelming. The outcome was attributed to this relic that changed the course of history. The triumph in Antioch paved the way for the Crusaders to reach Jerusalem. The holy city was conquered after a few months of siege and battle, consolidating Christian dominion over the entire Holy Land. Several years later, after Christian armies lost control of Jerusalem, which returned to Muslim hands, the relic of the lands was taken to Constantinople. This precious relic that pierced the side of Christ was kept in the city until 1492. The 
name of Longinus refers to the Roman soldier who, according to tradition, pierced Christ with a lance to quicken his death on the cross. This Roman soldier ended up repenting for his sins and converted. In fact, he's been venerated since the 4th century, and today we count him among the statues of saints in St. Peter's Basilica. The architect of the colonnade in St. Peter's Square and of the baldachin that guards the remains of the first pontiff is Gian Lorenzo Bernini. He also created this imposing statue of Longinus, more than 13 feet high, located in the center of the most important basilica of Christianity. The inscription underneath the statue explains part of a complex diplomatic history whose origins lie in Constantinople and which ends with the relic of the lance in Rome. It was donated to the Pope. It was given to Pope Innocent VIII, the Sibo Pope, by the Sultan of the Turks, Bayezid II. He gifted it because the Pope had hosted this Sultan's brother in Rome with great attention. A brother of Bayezid II named Sem tried to dethrone him and sought an alliance with the Knights Hospitaller, who had their headquarters on the island of Rhodes. The knights did not accept Sem's offer, so they held him as a prisoner and delivered him to Rome, around the same time as Pope Innocent VIII was planning to organize a crusade. The lack of international support to reconquer the Holy Land made the Catholic pontiff abandon his idea for a new crusade. He opted for the route of negotiation instead. Pope Innocent VIII reached an agreement with the Ottoman Sultan to keep his rebellious brother in Rome, under custody in the Vatican, so as to prevent him from disputing the throne. This agreement led to a period of peace in the Mediterranean. As a sign of appreciation, Bayezid II sent to Rome in 1492, the same year America was discovered, the relic of the lands that had been venerated since the Byzantine Empire. In the pontificate of Innocent VIII, the Sibo Pope, the lance represents an important moment, not only from a spiritual point of view, but also from a political point of view, since this marks a stage of dialogue. The church began to talk to the Turks and to develop some form of a relationship with them. What we have is a sultan who gives the Pope a relic that holds great importance for Christianity. The occurrence is of such note that the Pope had his own sepulcher, which, by the way, is a magnificent sculpture, built by Antonio Polaiolo over the course of five years, and which is the last monument he designed in St. Peter, adorned with his image seated upon a throne that shows the tip of the lance received from the Sultan of the Turks, Bayezid II. Another statue found under the dome of the Vatican, located in front of Peter's tomb, is a statue of St. Helena, the mother of Emperor Constantine. In the year 327, because her son was the emperor and she could do as she pleased, St. Helena led a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to find the relics of the cross. It was an incredible 2,175-mile journey at the outset of the 4th century. The entire Mediterranean Sea was part of the Roman Empire, and the Romans had built very good roads, those famous Roman roads. For this reason, traveling was much easier than is possible to imagine nowadays. The pilgrimage of St. Helena set a precedent among the noble people of the time. That's why St. Helena was not alone in this endeavor. Afterward, there were many pilgrimages that traveled to Jerusalem, and we have descriptions of these pilgrimages. It was a sort of trend of that period. People traveled from England toward Jerusalem or other places, much more easily than we can imagine today. Christians living in the Holy City led the Emperor's mother to a pagan temple dedicated to Venus. This Roman temple had been built for the precise reason of covering over the location of the crucifixion. Here, due to the excavations led by St. Helena on September 14th in the year 327, workers unearthed three crosses and a piece of wood, upon which the reason for the condemnation of Christ appeared to be inscribed. Legend has it that when St. Helena found these crosses, she approached a leper so that he might touch them. Only one of them healed him. The other two crosses were considered as those of the thieves who were crucified on the same day as Jesus. The mother of the emperor wanted to divide among three cities the main portions of the cross she dug up here, where this basilica stands today. One of them was conserved in Jerusalem, 
along with half of the inscription with the reason for his condemnation. Another she sent to the new seat of the empire, Constantinople, where her son lived, as a way to reinforce his authority throughout the world. Here, in this church in Rome, Holy Cross in Jerusalem, is where the largest portion of the cross is preserved, together with the other half of the titulus, with the reason for his condemnation. This area of the city was where Helena's family had their palace, and so these valuable relics were kept in the basement of this basilica. Pero esto era una cosa muy importante para... This was a very important event in the life of Rome. It showed that Rome could be considered a new Jerusalem. Constantinople may have been the new capital of the empire, but Rome is the new Jerusalem, the new spiritual capital of the empire. That is why the city holds great importance. And ever since the fourth century, there were many pilgrimages to Rome. We must also properly understand the idea of a pilgrimage. Today, through TV, we are able to see everything. We can see the Holy See, St. Peter's Basilica, and all the churches in Rome. We can see it all on TV. That's why we are able to unite ourselves spiritually without going to Rome. At that time, it was necessary to travel long distances to come into contact with the great basilicas of Christianity. And this particular church plays a major role in Rome, becoming the spiritual capital of the world, especially in relation to devotion to the Holy Cross. For this reason, the mother of the emperor arranged for the foundations upon which it was built to be sunk into a large amount of soil brought from Calvary in Jerusalem. Contrary to what many people believe, the relic of the cross has not remained intact since then. It was a question of statecraft that led Pope Leo X, who was originally from Florence, to decide to donate a part of the relic to the then king of France, Francis I. It was a diplomatic gesture with which he sought to strengthen ties with one of the great powers of Renaissance Europe. But his gesture also demonstrates the importance of the relic and the value that was attached to it throughout the Catholic world. No one doubted its authenticity. Now here, next to the cross, in this display, is kept a portion of the tablet explaining Jesus' condemnation. In Roman times, it was common that on the way to the place of torture, the prisoner was led by someone holding a written explanation of the offense for which he was suffering that penalty. It was this Titulus Crucis that remained hidden for centuries behind these very walls. The inscription is not written in an orthodox Greek. The title Titulus Crucis means it is the inscription of the reason for Christ's condemnation. It is called the Titulus Crucis. This was very interesting because it formed part of the wood of the cross. That's because if you read this Titulus Crucis carefully, it contains the same errors in Greek that were common during the first century after Christ, which clearly demonstrates that it was not a forgery. The important relics in this church include two thorns from the crown that pierced Christ's head. Thorns from the crown began to arrive in Europe after the Fourth Crusade, which resulted in the sack of Constantinople in 1204. The thorns had arrived there as a way of safeguarding them from the Muslims who controlled Jerusalem. Numerous studies have linked these thorns to the holy shroud venerated in Turin. In it are reflected, in the face of a deceased person, the wounds produced by small incisions. These traces of blood are associated with these specific types of thorns. Another element linked to the Passion of Jesus is one of the nails of the cross, which is kept in this Roman church. For many years, it has been kept protected in a reliquary that is shaped like a church. In the mid-20th century, doubts arose about the authenticity of this nail, especially when several experts discovered that its head resembled more recent ones. It was not original. However, a series of archaeological excavations carried out in Israel led to a surprising result in 1968. Just a few miles from Jerusalem, archaeologists discovered the buried body of a young man. Signs on his body showed that he had been crucified in the first century, around the time of Christ. His name was Yohanan. His heel was pierced by a square nail, which measured 4.7 inches long by 0.35 inches wide. 
These were the exact dimensions as the nail kept in the Church of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem. The nail was made from the same type of metal and had the same characteristics as the nail of another man crucified in the same year. Mere coincidence could not explain away all these facts. If someone had wanted to defraud believers, they clearly referenced an element from that time. But there is still another element that leads us to believe in the authenticity of the nail of Christ. The nail with which they crucified Johannan, which took place in the same period as Jesus' crucifixion, had also lost its head. Archaeologists attribute it to violent hammer blows, a brutal form of torture, which even destroyed the nails that pierced the body. After St. Helena's death, which occurred in the year 328, Emperor Constantine donated to the church the entire complex where his mother lived, and wherein were kept the valuable relics taken from Jerusalem. Around the 5th century, as was the custom in many churches, the relic with the reason for Jesus' condemnation written on it had been sealed inside a wall to protect it from theft. It was a period when anarchy reigned in the Eternal City. The wooden tablet containing part of the condemnation of Jesus was rediscovered in 1492, when renovation works were being carried out. Pope Alexander VI reinforced the authenticity of the relic four years later, with a papal bull granting a plenary indulgence to those who venerated it on the last Sunday in January. For this reason, ever since the 16th century, the basilica became a focal point for pilgrimages. St. Philip Neri included it as one of the seven principal churches to be visited in Rome during a holy year. Very close by sits another place representing one of the most dramatic moments of the Passion of Christ. The holy stairs are visited by faithful from all over the world. Climbing while kneeling, the 28 steps brought from Jerusalem is a unique experience. According to ancient tradition, this is the staircase Jesus walked up to present himself to Pontius Pilate after the Passover. He was condemned to death by Pilate, so he had to climb it more than once. This is because he had to return to Herod's palace and then return again before Pilate. Tradition holds that several deep stains found on these stairs are drops of blood. These marble steps, covered with wood to prevent their deterioration, reached the Eternal City in the 4th century. Their presence is recorded in documents from the 9th century. Later, two parallel staircases were added so that pilgrims could descend along the sides without running into those on their way up. Domenico Fontana, one of the great Roman architects of the 16th century, created the sanctuary that we see today. Ever since the early editions of Roman Jubilee years, the Holy Stairs have proven to be an obligatory point of reference. The tradition of climbing up while kneeling, all done in silence, as a sign of respect, turns into a penitential act, one that is difficult for many pilgrims to forget. Il senso è questo. The point is the following, to draw closer, even in a physical way, through the pain of going up the stairs on one's knees, to draw ourselves closer to the pain of Jesus. It is a gesture of recognition toward Jesus, in appreciation for everything he did for us, for our salvation. Therefore, what we undergo on our knees on these stairs is converted into identification with the person of Jesus. Absolute certainty that these were the same stairs upon which Christ walked is impossible. But there are several signs that bring us closer to Jerusalem. Investigations carried out regarding the type of marble prove that it comes from a region that is now part of Turkey. It was a marble widely used in that Roman period of the first centuries. Therefore, it is possible that this marble was transported to Jerusalem and that this took place during the time of Herod the Great. In addition to the marble steps, the holy stairs also hold other objects of veneration. 
tra le reliquie che riguardano la passione. Among the relics related to the passion is an ancient piece of wood from the cross of Jesus. When we speak of the cross, we are referring to the transverse part that Jesus himself carried at the moment of his condemnation. When he began the way of the cross toward Calvary, which was placed upon the long part that was already there. Sul palo che già era lì. Just a short walk from the Holy Stairs, in the same area of Rome, sits one of the most famous basilicas in the city, St. Mary Major, which dates back to the 5th century. Few people know it, but under the altar of St. Mary Major, there's a small chapel built with stones brought from Bethlehem. Inside, a reliquary contains several pieces of wood that came from the very grotto where the baby Jesus was born. St. Mary Major had actually been called St. Mary of the Manger for many centuries for this very reason of containing the wood that could have held baby Jesus. It was around the year 646, under the papacy of Pope Theodore I, when this relic was transferred to Rome. It was called the Holy Crib. However, it would be better to call it the Manger of Bethlehem. This is because the reliquary really contains four boards that had been part of the wooden structure in which, according to the Gospel, the Blessed Mother, after Jesus was born, had wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Pope Theodore I, who was born in Jerusalem, is credited with bringing these pieces of wood to Rome. The reason again was the difficulty of safeguarding devotion in an area dominated by Muslims. For centuries, this was the basilica in which the Pope celebrated Mass on Christmas Eve, and it held great importance for the faithful. This relic later gave rise to a special form of devotion, one that focused not so much on the relic itself, which was surely venerated for centuries as it still is today, but rather on the mystery of the nativity. Therefore, here a grotto was built to resemble the grotto of Bethlehem. special church in which petals are thrown from the ceiling every year on August 5th. They recall a legendary event. According to tradition, the Pope dreamt that he should build a church dedicated to the Virgin in Rome at a place to be revealed by a snowfall in the middle of August, the hottest month in Italy. The relics of the Holy Crib survived the sack of Rome in 1527. No one can confirm that Jesus actually slept on these pieces of wood as a newborn. But studies have shown that the trees they come from are native to Palestine. Before being nailed to the cross, the Gospels recount that Christ suffered the punishment of scourging. Roman law stated the penalty was to be carried out in a public place. It was usually done with the defendant tied to a column. In this small church, which was built in the 8th century near St. Mary Major, there is a column from Palestine that is venerated as linked to the Passion of Christ. It measures only 25 inches in height because it has been severed at the top. It has a hole at the top that is just large enough to chain a person to. The moment the column arrived in Rome is verified. It's the year 1223, during the Fifth Crusade. Cardinal Giovanni Colonna participated as the Pope's delegate in an attempt to regain control of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. This enterprise was led by German, Hungarian, and Austrian princes. Despite some limited victories, it ended with the Crusaders surrendering in Egypt. 
The column from the scourging was venerated in Jerusalem. It was one of the few objects related to the passion that had remained in the Holy Land after the fall of Israel's capital at the hands of the Muslims 30 years earlier. Cardinal Colonna wanted to take it to Rome. Instead of taking it to one of the city's great basilicas, he wanted to keep it in this small church, St. Proxides, of which he was the titular cardinal. This gesture gave greater prominence to his last name, Colonna, which in Italian means column, by relating it to the passion of Christ. For centuries, the Colonna family has remained one of the greatest families in Rome. Their palace is still used for private family matters, with the column as its symbol. We are on the Appian Way. This is the road that led from the port of Naples to the Eternal City. It was a commercial link as popular as it was prosperous. On both sides of this road, there are still the remains of villas, funeral monuments, and even an area for chariot races, called the Circus of Maxentius. During the period when St. Peter was in the Eternal City, this road still held all its splendor. And right here, next to this important trade route, sits the church of Cuovadis, or where are you going? Here, in the floor, are venerated a set of footprints which measure nearly 10 inches. They would currently correspond to a male U.S. shoe size 11 and a half, something truly remarkable for the first century of the Christian era. The tradition of venerating these footprints dates back to the second century. The church was built in the 9th century and has guarded these intriguing footprints ever since. Legend has it that, after a few months of unsuccessful preaching in Rome, St. Peter gave up trying. One day, when the Christian persecution was growing more intense, he decided to take the road back to Palestine. He had barely left the walls of the city when the risen Christ appeared to him, walking toward Rome in the opposite direction. Lord, where are you going? Or Domine Cuovadis in Latin, the apostle asked. I am going to Rome to be crucified again was the answer that made Peter turn back around. There's nothing to stop us from believing that Jesus Christ made himself present to Peter at a time when perhaps, in fear of persecution, the apostle was fleeing Rome. What we can say is that the footprints in the Cuovadis church are from one of the stones that indicated the roads for the Romans and Christians. Perhaps wanting to point out that the life of St. Peter was marked by an extraordinary event that changed his own path. Wanted to record that episode in his life story. Before being executed on the Vatican Hill, the first successor of Christ suffered a difficult ordeal. Here, next to the Roman Forum, lies one of the oldest prisons in the world, in which St. Peter was imprisoned. The complex has two floors of caves, dug into one of the seven hills of Rome, the Capitoline Hill. Archaeological excavations show that its construction took place in the 6th century BC. Afterward, it was converted into a prison to house the illustrious enemies of Rome. Its name, the Tulanium Prison, derives from the Latin word for a water cistern, or Tullus. Tradition has it that, in this small cell, which can only be accessed by a narrow staircase, a miracle occurred. When he was imprisoned, St. Peter made water spout forth after hitting the stone wall with a cane. Thanks to this, he was able to baptize several of his cellmates with the water. Since this is tradition, we cannot know for sure that St. Peter was there. What is certain is that, according to a local Roman tradition that had to do with stone coffins that are adorned with inscriptions, there are around 50 sarcophagi tombs that depict St. Peter with his jailers. They even show the jailers in front of the water. This could be a way of proving that they were really there, even though no written source has been found. What is certain is that, ever since the early centuries of Christianity, the Tulianum, or Mamertine prison, has become a place of pilgrimage. To facilitate the pilgrims' prayers, a church was built in the 16th century just above the jail cells, San Giuseppe de Falegnami, or St. Joseph of the Carpenters. The 
other great apostle of Christianity, a contemporary of Jesus, is also buried in Rome. St. Paul outside the walls is the basilica in which St. Paul is buried, and something beyond tradition invites us to believe in the authenticity of his burial place. Professor Lucrezia Spera directed the latest excavations in this area and made fascinating discoveries. We found part of a very long route with a portico which led from the Aurelian walls to the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. Then, from St. Paul's, it returned along the Ostian Way toward the south. There is a large, covered walkway, which reflects the large number of pilgrims who were already coming to this place at the end of the 5th century. There are also archaeological data that point to the time when Paul of Tarsus lived. The first monumental testimonies that indicate the presence of two tombs in the Vatican and along the Ostian Way appear at the end of the 2nd century and at the beginning of the 3rd century, during the pontificate of Pope Zephyrinus. During that period, there was already a tombstone or some element to indicate the existence of St. Paul's tomb, which had been placed in a cemetery on the Ostian Way. Overflows of the Tiber River, which runs only a few feet from the Basilica, have caused floods in this area for centuries. Therefore, unlike the tomb of St. Peter, the burial place of St. Paul is more difficult to detect. Throughout the years, while the tomb has never been disturbed, at the same time it also hasn't been uncovered with precision. The succession of constructions which began, as we said at the end of the second century, only two or three generations after the martyrdom of Paul, make this the most likely, if not the absolute location of the Apostle's tomb. Yet, what dispels certain doubts surrounding this tomb, from an archaeological point of view, is the continuity of the constructions in the area. There's the Trophy of Gaius, the Basilica of Constantine, and the Great Basilica of the Three Emperors, as well as all the subsequent development of settlements and imposing buildings. These constructions provide visible testimony to an influx of pilgrims that has not been interrupted for more than 20 centuries. This great basilica is one more in a chain of references to people connected to the Holy Land. A connection that shapes the essence of this city. Rome is filled with references to Jerusalem, to the Holy Cross, as well as to several architectural references like St. Stephen in the Round, which seems to recall the model of the Anastasis. So the memory of Jerusalem has surely remained in the city in different eras. However, her identity is that of a city which, through Christianity, is associated with the Jerusalem of heaven. The historical reality of Christianity, along with the apostles who lived and died in this city during the first century of our era, creates great interest in millions of people. And we can be sure that the preaching message begun by Jesus Christ in the Holy Land has found continuity among these streets. The hearts of the first Christians still beat in the basilicas of Rome.